So we've talked about Benjamin Franklin as a as a public leader. We've talked about him as a businessman. We've talked about him as an inventor and scientist. Uh, now, I, I think that the, the last piece of the Benjamin Franklin puzzle is just him as, for lack of a better word, him as founding father. Yes, and as a diplomat in particular, because he was America's first diplomat. The, in about 1757, he becomes the ambassador or agent of the Pennsylvania colony uh, to represent uh, Pennsylvania in London uh, with the ministers to try to uh, make sure that the rights of the assembly and the people of Pennsylvania were taken into account. And eventually, off and on over the next you know, 17 or 18 years, he becomes an agent for a lot of the colonies and starts representing the interests of the American colonies in London. This is a really important time in American history because this is when tensions between the U.S., uh, between the colonies and, and Great Britain are really uh, c coming to a head. You have the French and Indian War, really kind of part of a larger uh, uh, European war, but that ends in 1763. The, the, the British want the, the colonies to pay for it. Right. That's the big deal, which is the British think that the American colonies you know, have to pay because Britain helped protect them in the French and Indian War. And they just start putting taxes on the uh, American colonies. And the American colonies by this point are as sophisticated and as strong of an economy as Britain. They don't feel that they should be dictated mm. to by the people in London. And they have their own legislatures in each of the colonies. So they're saying, yeah, we know we have to have taxes, but our legislatures should do the taxes. We don't want taxation without representation, as became the rallying cry. And so it was up to Franklin to try to talk the British Parliament out of things like the Stamp Act, where every time you bought a piece of paper or a newspaper, you had to pay a tax to London, and to give the power to the colonial legislatures. So he was really, you know, when we read in the history books this whole t time period of, you know, uh, things uh, coming, uh, the tensions rising, it was really Benjamin Franklin that was trying to negotiate, communicate the anger, really. And was he was very close to a lot of the people in London mm -hmm. then. It was part of the Enlightenment. There's a wonderful picture of him there in London uh, in which there's Isaac Newton looking over his shoulder and so he is part of that yeah. intellectual class of like Dr. Johnson and all the people in London. But unfortunately, the government is still run by a very aristocratic Tory elite. And Franklin has trouble convincing them to give rights to the American colonies. And, and this breaking up, I mean, it does kind of pain him because, as you mentioned, this is the Enlightenment. Benjamin mm -hmm. Franklin is a kind yeah. of a key, you know, he, he, he And he, he had tamed electricity. He was a great scientist. Yes. So this is this great man living in a small house in London right near the Parliament. Uh, and he's very well respected by all the intellectuals, but he gets treated very badly by the Parliament. At one point, he's called in front of what's called the cockpit, <laughs> which is a part of Parliament, and he is humiliated uh, because they make fun of him for trying to uh, stop the Parliament from taxing the colonies, and that enrages Benjamin Franklin, and that finally tips him over to being closer to the side of we may have to have a revolution and just break away from England. And that actually leads to family problems because his son... Yeah, so he brought his illegitimate son William over with him and he's very close to William. But William becomes quite aristocratic despite the fact or maybe because of the fact that he was illegitimate kid of a middle-class person. He starts hanging around with the dukes and the earls and he ends up being appointed by the crown, basically the government and the king, to be the royal governor in New Jersey. So William Franklin becomes a dedicated loyalist to the crown of England just as his father Benjamin Franklin is becoming a rebel and siding with those who want a revolution. Uh, and so... Everything eventually, and we know how history went, mm -hmm. uh, 1775, mm -hmm. 1776, hostilities begun, 1775, Franklin goes back. Franklin yes. goes back. He goes back unsuccessful because he had tried to stop the hostilities. Mm -hmm. He gets back to Philadelphia once again at Market Street. He comes off the boat, and everybody in Philadelphia is kind of wondering, 
Is he loyal to the British Empire and the crown, or has he truly joined the cause of revolution? And he has a meeting with his son, who's then the royal governor of New Jersey, and he tells his son he's going to become a revolutionary. His son says, I'm going to stay loyal to the crown. They basically barely speak to each other again for the rest of their lives. This is a great break. And Franklin announces to the people in uh, Philadelphia that he's going to join the cause of American independence. And that's when he gets to work with... Jefferson and Adams on the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776. And right after that, in order to make the Declaration a reality, they realized we have to get France in on our side mm-hmm. of the war. You mentioned that uh, the French and Indian War, that the British and the French had been fighting for a century almost, off and on. So in order for the U.S. to win its independence in a war against Britain, it would help to have the support of the French, who were naturally willing to fight Britain, given any (laughs) opportunity, and were already part of a larger global war uh, with Britain. So he becomes ambassador in Paris in order to get the French in. Now, if you look at those two pictures, it's kind of cool, because there's Franklin in London, you know, looking like quite a gentleman in a velvet coat. (laughs) When he gets to France, he realizes that the French people have been reading, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, maybe once too often, about all the natural man in the forest and how the natural philosopher comes from the backwoods. Franklin never lived in the backwoods. He lived in (laughs) Boston, Philadelphia, and London his whole life. But when he gets to Paris, he wears a coonskin cap and sort of a backwoodsman coat so that he can appear to the French as sort of this wilderness, (laughs) natural man, philosopher from the forest, talking about independence and liberty. And that's what he did. I mean, you know, essentially most of the rest, he does eventually return. But he's in Paris. He does convince the French to get in on the side to of get the on the side of the war. And uh, I mean, he spends a significant amount of time there and, and becomes. Oh, very, he becomes a grand old man yeah. of Paris. First of all, as a yeah. diplomat, convincing the French to come in on the side of the war. As a publicist, he he mm-hmm. makes a printing press in his house near Paris place called Passy, and he prints the Declaration of Independence and all the great documents coming out of America. Of course, he's renowned as a scientist because the French had been the first people to do his lightning rod experiment. So they love him in France. And he's kind of, he has, you know, Deborah Reed has died by this point. So even as he's in his 70s, he has two famous uh, girlfriends, Mm. mistresses in Mm. Paris, and he writes wonderful poetry and bagatelles and stories to them. So he is a great bon vivant in Paris. So it's a bit of a Parisian. Very much of a Parisian and uh, drinks uh, wonderful amounts of port. John Adams also has to come to Paris at a certain point. John Adams is very much the Puritan. And even though they had worked together for many years, they didn't really like each other. And uh, John Adams was appalled at Franklin having two girlfriends and getting up late in the morning and um, drinking a lot of port and brandy. But it is Franklin who's able to get the French in on our side. And then the triumph in Paris is called the Treaty of Paris, when the war is winding down and, Br- and Benjamin Franklin is able to negotiate the treaty with Britain to end the American Revolution and give uh, the U.S. its independence, and uh, it ends the war. And Franklin is able to do it working with the French, sometimes behind the back of the French, a very wily diplomat. And at that point, they've kicked John Adams out because they know <laughs> they didn't like him. Ben Franklin's the guy who can make this complicated peace happen. And they liked him more. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was definitely, <laughs> if you had to choose who you're going to spend the evening with in Paris, you'd pick Ben Franklin over John Adams, even though we have to give John Adams due oh, respect for being a very, very important patriot. And, and you know, just a big picture. I mean, this was one something that was surprising to me, is that you know, Benjamin Franklin, who is, uh, you know, kind of uh, one of our larger-than-life founding fathers, his role was not to pick up a musket. His role was, you know, for the kind of the second half of his life, he was in Europe. He was in London. He was in Paris. And he was really there to represent the country and to negotiate with both England as kind of an adversary or a, a, mm-hmm. eventually an adversary um, and, and with Paris as, as an ally. And we would not really have won the revolution without his diplomacy because it's the French 
who send most of the gunpowder we use, most of the troops we use. It's Verjean, the French foreign minister, who helps uh, send uh, a navy so that at Yorktown, uh, when George Washington wins the battle, that pretty much ends the revolution because the French navy is there supporting him. So all of these things work, and finally, near the end, you know, in 1885, I think, as he's, you know, just about to turn 80, he comes back for the last few years of his life, gets involved in the Constitutional Convention, and becomes a great elder statesman. Fascinating. 